So. Schönen guten Nachmittag. Mein Name Hello, ist good evening. My gehört? name is Andy Butius, as you as you've already heard, and we've got 25 minutes ahead of us to take a deep breath and a deep dive and think about World Ocean Day. You know, um, every day is dedicated to some specific issue, and today is World Ocean Day, and this is why I would like to take a dive together with you and look at how we're connected to the ocean at all times and how decisive this very decade is and how important the role of every one of us is. This image is very capturing. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to interact and s interact with and see a whale. It is fascinating. And even though there's no natural predators for whales, because humans understand how intelligent and helpful this mammal is, we still endanger them, not by hunting them, but by polluting their environment, for example, with ships. So it happens all the time that we humans love something, appreciate something, want to protect something, and we achieve the exact opposite. So we need a framework to make our um, aspirations work. Maya Goupil talked about it today as well. So I would like to talk about that today. Let's do a shift of perspectives. Imagine you're entering a capsule and you're diving down into the ocean to see and explore your relationships with this vast body of water. We need to get into a ball of thick steel that is completely hermetic. There's rarely any maps. We don't have a real understanding of this part of the world. And I'm one of those people whose job it is to dive down, and it's always a highlight. Every dive gets you in contact with life forms that no one has ever seen before. We don't have many manned submarines, and we use them to discover crazy life forms such as this. This um, glowfish is a symbol. This is the only. Um, this is the only image of a pregnant glowfish, which is one of the most common deep sea fishes. And our um, exploration found that they have those antennas that glow. And you, um, this um, fish is pregnant, and you can even see the father here. The other sex is tiny. They only have one job, to find a um, female and impregnate her. And when the male fish docks to the female fish, um, a placenta is built, and then um, the conception takes pla place. And then um, enzymes um, eat the rest. Nothing is wasted in the ocean. And I could tell you a lot of stories about crazy animals like those, animals that you see when you dive in the deep sea, whether you're a researcher or whether you just open a book and laugh about the pictures, you have to ask yourself, how does it work? You have this worm here that's really hairy, and it's um, the most heat-resistant life uh, form on Earth. There's a fish th that you wouldn't know is an octopus, and so on. They're all part of our environment. They live in the ocean, and many of them have an evolution that is a lot longer than um, that of the trees on Earth, and they're all Threatened. Deep sea is so uncanny because 
Um, it has 90% of the diversity of species of the Earth. Even though there's so few resources, the only resources that the ocean has is debris that uh, comes down. And plastic is a huge problem there. And we're only just waking up and trying to change something about the problem. And other threats um, have to do with the CO2 that we release into um, the environment. This is another fascinating image, coral reefs. I've never met a person that could say something against coral reefs, someone who hates coral reefs. Maybe if you uh, just crash crushed your yacht into it, it may be annoying, but otherwise, um, if you go snorkeling on a reef, you will think, I've never see some, seen something so beautiful in my life, and you have to understand, this is part of my crazy knowledge, that corals are animals, and they're next to sponges, they're the oldest living beings. And they're exactly adjusted to their environment if the host um, is stressed. So if you um, go to a bar and your barkeeper is stressed, you leave the bar. And this is what the um, single cell parasites do with the uh, corals. And this is what happening. what is happening. The corals are stressed because we've surpassed, uh, because the water is getting warmer. And we have to decide, do we keep on increasing the global temperature or do we try our best to lower it? We've just reached a horrifying record. The Great Barrier Reef, the biggest coral structure of the Earth, is destroyed by 90%. And that means that fishes can't seek refuge in it anymore. So if you're a fish and you're moving in these corals, you're immediately eaten. That's clear. And that hurts to know. And this is why this decade is so decisive. I've um, put a graph on here. On the x-axis, you see the time progression. And on the y-axis, you see the CO2 progression. The blue arrows shows when I was uh, born. I'm a 320 ppm child. You can all check where you're born. So when I was born, scientists were already writing letters to the government saying, we're just about to terminate the Earth's biggest experiment. We have to exit from fossil energies. Um, a lot of uh, knowledge spread, and we've no, uh, we know no limits in measuring pollution and still surpassing it year after year. We have the World Climate Council that publishes reports every year and still, the CO2 level is rising and rising and rising. The Paris Agreement was the last um, great conference that said we want to limit global warming to two degrees. Fridays for Futures um, still didn't live to see a change in the temperature cor curve. We keep on warming, but it, uh, warning, it's not enough. We go to the streets, it's not enough. So what do we need to do? I want to dive into two examples with you. Here we see ourselves in a difficult graph that says it all. We're the black curve. This is our emissions worldwide. The red and orange curve is all the promises our governments make where they're going to take it if we just want it. And in green, you see... Sorry, green is uh, the promises, and now we're in red. That is the goal. You can see the gap in light red, and this is the decade of decisions. We want to exit from fossil energies, so we should take the orange curve. And you can see that between today and uh, 2030, everything has to happen. 
We're watching and we're helping take this decision for the ocean and for our lives. How do we do that? We need to do it. Do it. And this is what Maya Gupu said earlier. If we're, we, we don't do something, if we continue like we do, we see, um, we're going to see what you can see here on the right, 2,000 years of Earth, and you can see how the temperature is rising. This is what has already been measures, measured. This is not the future. We've already reached 1.2 degrees of warming. And if we continue, it results in forest fires and so on. So we're playing with insecurities um, which, with what is below the earth and which rises to um, our level. So this is the image you have to see if you want to understand why you need to fight for the oceans. Because they're so huge, the oceans are doomed to absorb more than 90% of the warmth that we produce. 3% goes into the ice masses with bad um, ramifications, and just 1% is the atmosphere, and this is what we're fighting about. So if the oceans are not able to absorb that heat anymore, we're going to have dramatic shifts. So how do we make the oceans help us even though we um, did so much damage to them. This is the big debate. Here you can see the uh, time axis again. From the industrialization until 2019, all the CO2 emission, emission data. This is my favorite um, graph to show everything that you need to know. In yellow and red, the emissions we cause. Uh, light yellow is our agriculture, how we plant trees but don't water them. In orange, um, this is the um, combustion of fuel, um, fossil fuel. There's not an increase in coal. Uh, there's a decrease in oil, but uh, there will be a rise. And in blue, we see the oceans that absorb 25% of uh, CO2. That's uh, less than the warmth I just talked about, because um, if there's no CO2, uh, if there's more CO2 in the air, the oceans absorb more. Now you see the zigzag down there. Why is this so dynamic? Why aren't the ocean absorbing more? The problem is that our ecosystems on the land, the um, marshes and so on, are very sensitive. If, it's, if there's heat and if it's dry, um, trees even start to give off CO2. And this is why there's uh, such a zigzag line. You can see the light blue, the um, teal. This is what we add. So our role right now would be to say, We've added so much CO2, we need more land to absorb it because it has already oxidized its CO2 already. And um, we have to return it to the biomass. That's um, centuries that we're talking about. And they can only be taken away by the land and the ocean. So what do we need to do? We need to strengthen the ocean and the land. We need to cultivate um, landscapes that are um, fit to take up CO2. Those are, for example, coral reefs, but the coral reefs are almost destroyed. We've heard about that. So are there more robust systems that can absorb CO2? And what about them? We have mangroves. Mangroves are the only trees that grow in water. And and then you have slime and murk that stinks, but it absorbs a lot of CO2. And there's a lot of biodiversity as well. And what do we do? We cultivate tiger shrimps in the mangrove forest so we can have shrimp salad. 
So we have the kelp forests, that's an ancient plant, and it's the fastest growing plant on Earth. We've lost 70% of them because they can't sustain the heat. To um, re-establish them, if we built floating kelp uh, forests, the, uh, those um, algae meadows are returning slowly because we've become better in limiting our um, pollution of the waters. So this is um, exhausting and expensive, but it's something we can do. We can rebuild reefs, which we're already doing. We've returned oysters to the Baltic Sea that we've um, eradicated because of fishing. Um, so there's a lot we can do, but it's very expensive and it's very exhaustive. And we haven't even started to build back the ecosystems we once had in Germany. The other world in which I can uh, dive at times are the polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And why, why are these worth fighting for? As a PhD student in the 90s, I was able to experience what it's like to visit these ice shelves, but today this, these shelves are really thin, they're really soft, you can actually go through them and all the life in and on the ice has already changed due to climate change. If we look at our one ocean, which all of us are connected to and understand what it does for us, it sinks heat and carbon dioxide, it contains all the life on life forms on Earth that are probably going to produce our medicine at some point. That's why this is the decisive decade, because we are on the way to losing all this. And we put ourselves in danger. One of the most exciting and most brutal research results is how fast the Antarctic is warming. It's got this ocean around it that's supposed to be cooling it, but everything is getting warmer and melting. 70% of the of global freshwater reserves are in the Antarctic, and it's going to take a few thousand years for them to melt. But if that happens, we'd have 50 meters uh, sea level rise. The red region on this map here, if everything melts down, we're going to have three meters of sea level rise, and we're not prepared for this in northern Germany. And this scales with the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. Lots of people say, well, that's evolution, we're only an animal, we're going to die out, the cockroaches are going to remain. I would call these cynical debates because nothing of what we're doing has to be that way. It could be completely different. But we, as um, researchers, have to tell people about this. And this is a graphic that goes millions of years back when sharks um, evolved in the oceans. That's the story of our global temperatures. We are at zero today, and we're heading for where this red line is going and going all the way back, throwing ourselves back to the Miocene when dinosaurs were still alive. The difference is that the sea level is going to be a different one. In closing, I would like to give you some words of actions. These were all reasons why we have to act. But one of the biggest decisions ahead of us is that we want to extend the oceans or build the oceans. We want to use new technologies to protect life on and in the sea. We have to make sure that um, these steps are going right. What few people know is that since 2000, the importance of aquaculture has increased so much that we have more fish and more creatures from aquaculture than from uh, than captured in the wild, which is good for, for wild species, but it's very damaging to the environment. 
If you eat lac uh, salmon, you have to um, have to check where it where it came from, what kind of traces it left in the environment. But in theory, theory we have technology to improve our lives. Um, I have a good and a bad example. Uh, one of them is. Um, our decision that we want to stop deep sea fishing it's almost been banned we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, we have deep sea cables but we're very very doing well on that shipping is supposed to be climate neutral we want to protect um, the seas to uh, to, uh, to gain resources but what we haven't fixed is our need for scarce resources. Everything that we love contains in part um, rare earth metals that uh, we have too few of. And this is our footprint. We started taking, uh, using the entire periodic table to uh, enhance technology, but we don't know where we're supposed to be get, getting them from in future. It's uh, gruesome to see how these metals are being extracted in, uh, in traditional mining. If you've uh, visited countries where these materials come from, you, it, it makes you physically sick and you're not sure if you want to actually buy the next iPhone. So what we have on Earth isn't enough and so we have to uh, go into the oceans. These rare Earth metals exist in the oceans as um, these um, in, in the sea floor. And since the 70s, we've been researching how we can uh, extract these, <laughs> these black cauliflowers from four or five kilometers down. The way of doing this is being researched. There's been some pilot tests, and that's why we in Europe decided to create a consortium of um, scientists, not, necessar not necessarily because we think it's great. We, we think it's a very problematic technology, but we want to um, want to collect data and show that it's complicated and probably disastrous to mine the seafloor. We, we started doing this with uh, these nets with trawling and uh, saw how how damaging it, it is. How is that supposed to work? This this graphic shows it. If, um, if you've seen one of these machines, um, there's a human for scale, and there you have to imagine this this machine going around on the sea floor and extracting manganese. Uh, the, the, the industry says that it's about about. Well, they're, they're acting in the best interests of humanity. But if you look at it, if you conduct experiments, and I, as a young person, I was I was allowed to take part in these experiments by Schriever and Thiel. The, the sea floor that's been treated in this way doesn't come back. It's the same way on land. Uh, uh, if you plow the earth, it doesn't return the same. So we conducted the experiments um, and looked at what happens 25, 30 years later. This is um, the eye of a robot where some scientists looked at what happens when you plow the sea floor. Even 30 years later, the animals haven't returned. It still looks the same. There are animals like this ghost octopus that is breeding on this uh, manganese clump. And this all is connected. So trying to improve humanity by collecting these resources is also destroying strange and wonderful life of the deep sea. So what can we do? We have to understand all this. And I know how difficult our struggle on, on land is. But today, on the day of the oceans, I would like to encourage you to talk about what what does this do to the oceans? Can I make a different decision? You can, you can um, actually you can talk to politicians. You can we can, uh, with the G7, which um, owns a large part of the uh, ocean floor, we can 
request a future and build a future that we want, because we're all in the same boat and we should know which way we are heading. Thank you so much for your attention.